So um, I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, the first is Dr. Rich Pfeiffer, who is Chief Medical Officer uh, of National Accounts at Aetna. And then we will be having Susan Neumuller from Penske, and she is the Benefits Manager, and Ryan June, who is the Director of Healthcare Analytics at Teladoc. Um, the session was featured in the 2015 IBI Annual Forum, where Penske, a global transportation services provider, partnered with Aetna and Teladoc to explore a more um, better telemedicine options and care for their workforce. Um, so I'll go ahead and let our speakers take it away. Wonderful. Thanks, JC. This is Rich Pfeiffer. It's great to be with everybody today. Thanks for joining this webinar. And we can go to the first slide, those of you who are, are logged into the portal. Yes, these are our names, our titles. And, and our talk today is about leveraging telemedicine to improve access to care, reduce absence, and control costs. This is a subject of uh, such emerging, growing, and evolving interest in our industry right now. I'd say even since the IBI forum back in the wintertime, this has evolved further. Uh, so let's get right into it. Let's talk about what telemedicine is. We'll go right to the next slide, JC, the one that says, what is telemedicine? Next slide, please. And if you look across expert bodies, authorities, to even define what telemedicine is, you realize very quickly that there are a lot of definitions out there. They're not all the same. There is no one standard. And so if there's some internal or even external organizational confusion, if you've experienced that working with other companies, it should be no surprise. But there's, there's a commonality to it all. And so let's go to the, the next slide, and, and we're going to propose a working definition. Working definition means we wrote this. <laughs> but it brings together some of the definitions that are out there. And we'll define telemedicine as, as two-way Real-time, that's an important point, real-time communication between the patient and clinician for the provision of health care using telecommunications technologies of some sort to connect them from distant geographic sites. So that's foundationally what we're talking about. And there are other aspects of telehealth, which is a broader concept that are maybe not real time and other things that might be going on that don't involve the patient or what have you. But what we're talking about today is patients receiving care from a clinician in real time from distant geographic sites. And, and so let's talk about, first of all, why do employers and why do members care? Why is this even of value? Why are we discussing this? The next slide gets to that. And so what are the benefits? Well, we certainly talk about costs a lot in our industry, don't we? Because we have a big cost challenge in the healthcare industry. And so cost is one of the objectives, right? To, let's say, avert expensive visits to an emergency room when a telephone support mechanism will do and, and other ways of avoiding direct medical costs. Certainly that is one of the goals, but it's not the only goal that employers, such as some of you and members, patients, have. Access is another issue, and we know that in our country today, access to care is a very relevant issue, and it, it's not always sufficient. Not everyone has a primary care provider that they can access in a timely way. Convenience is also pertinent, because even though people may have access, and they may have coverage, and costs may be managed, convenience is, is ever so important in, in our world when everyone has such busy lives, so costs and access... Now, convenience is a separate goal and a very important one. As we are in the, in the work of consumer-directed health care, we need to think about health care through the eyes of consumers. And convenience is one of their biggest priorities when we actually go and ask them what they want, what they need. And then finally, absence. And that's a goal through the lens of the employer in many cases. To, to leave work or, or be absent from work for a few hours while one gets to seeks, obtains, and then returns from a doctor's visit, that's inefficient. And there are sometimes situations where we can avoid all that inefficiency, and telemedicine is part of that solution. So these are the four reasons why, why people care. Let's go to the next slide and, and cite a few data points around access as being one of the drivers. We know that 80% of adults discharged from the ER are there due to lack of access to another provider. We have to ask the question, if we solve for access, how much of that could we get down? How much could we avoid? And, and we're seeing projected increases to primary care visits due to the ACA and other innovations and also the growth of our population, the aging of our population. 
Well, we have a shortage of primary care doctors, so this is only going to get worse. So we have to deal with the access issue among the other issues. Now, employers are already, already all over this, and many of you on the call today are employers. So let's, let's go to the next slide. This should resonate really strongly. Employers are adopting telemedicine, and as I say to other audiences who are asking, what, are, what do employers think about all this? What I say is, this isn't, this isn't bleeding edge or cutting edge. This is here. This is very real. Nearly half of employers are, are covering telemedicine in some way. It's growing. Many are adopting plan designs to incent the use of telemedicine where appropriate. So this is very much mainstream. I'm sure you're experiencing that. <clears throat> and some of the reason why is that, is that telemedicine has been around for a while. We have a good experience knowing what works and what doesn't. And so let's walk through some of the published data on telemedicine. Ne next slide. <clears throat> The first slide is an article from Health Affairs from, from last year addressing the issue of access to, to, access to care for diverse conditions while quality. quality. And we, we see some surprising results in this study. First, what we discover is that the range of conditions and the range, the range of reasons why people seek telemedicine and receive telemedicine is broader than what many intuitively would have thought. In fact, it, it's broader than, um, than retail clinics, right? So, so there's more breadth than we think when we actually look at what's, what's happening. And then when we ask the question, well, how, how good is the care? A proxy for measuring that is how often do people have to have a follow-up visit somewhere? How often do they need to have something changed downstream? And in fact, the rates of follow-up visits are very, very low, and they're, they're comparable to other venues of care. And so this is a, one of the important studies, but it's not the only one. Let's go to the next page. And, uh, and another study looked at, looked at cost and, and getting at similar issues. Cost is lower, and most importantly, again, resolution rates are similar, right? And so we're seeing a pattern of data emerge. Let's go to the next slide. And, and the next slide is looking at... Uh, at treatment outcomes again with greater convenience, looking at uh, sinusitis. Now we'll go to the next one, uh, JC, slide 11. Good. Sinusitis, urinary tract infections, again, similar outcomes as in-person visits, visits, same rates of treatment failure and follow-up visits. So, so there's a pattern in the peer-reviewed medical literature that's corroborating what we're hearing from patients, which is that actually this is working pretty well uh, when, when uh, applied to and delivered for appropriate conditions. So that's what employers are thinking. That's what the data is telling us. What do, what do employees, what do, what do members, what do, what do people think about all this? And, and, um, and actually, we've surveyed people. Let's go to the next slide, and this is the summary of a survey of, of Aetna members who were actually utilizing one of our tools, and we did a flash survey. We were able to get 2,422 responses to this survey, which was really wonderful. Um, this is the, the power of the, uh, of the Internet, the power of mobile technology these days. And, and the findings are really stellar. Now, I will caveat this by saying that the respondents here are those who are more, um, more uh, technologically inclined. Okay, fine. Uh, but that's, that's most of our population, and it's growing. But the interesting part is that the interest in using telemedicine is not limited to minor acute care. It's not limited to ear infections, sinusitis, urinary infections. There's a lot of patient interest in using telemedicine to support their chronic conditions, in obtaining second opinions, in addressing mental health, dermatology, sexual health. You see the list. So, so the demand is out there. And now what we're doing is trying to engineer a system and a process in, in a cost-effective way just to meet the existing demand, and that demand is only growing. Uh, let's go to the next slide. The next slide asks the question, or I should say it, it begins to answer it, where does telemedicine fit in the, in the ecosystem? Is it, is it out there, off to the side? And, and I would argue, no, it's not off to the side. Telemedicine needs to be a part of a, a well-integrated uh, system of care that it still includes retail clinics, convenient care clinics, certainly includes and is grounded in primary care, and that, that is connected so that patient care in one venue or via one channel is communicated to and with the other channels so that all partners in care are part of a team, a virtual team, but a team. And this, this needs to be supported with full visibility to patient data, and it need to be, needs to be supported with decision support both at a consumer level to help people find the right venue for what is bothering them today so we help them with that identification. And also at the provider level, 
so that the best of evidence-based care is, is brought to bear. So this is a tightly integrated system, and there are many technologies out there to support that. Um, and, and so ultimately, telemedicine is not something separate. It needs to dock in, and it, and it increasingly is docking in very nicely with everything else that, that is improving in the care of patients. And, and let me end, before I turn it over to my colleagues, with the next slide specifically addressing what I think is a very real and important point of concern. How does telemedicine today for minor acute care relates to the need for people to have primary care physician or primary care provider relationships. And, and it's our belief, and I think most would agree, that it's very important that these need to be mutually reinforcing. And so how does this work? As we deploy it, and I think many other models would, would, would say the same, that we reinforce the importance of a primary care relationship, even if the telemedicine provider at a point in time isn't that person's primary care doctor due to access issues or whatever else, but reinforcing the importance of the primary care for follow-up, for long-term care, communicating the visit and the details back to primary care, um, downplaying the notion that telemedicine should be the long-term solution for a chronic or recurring problem, but rather returning patients back to a care setting where longitudinal care is, is more appropriate and monitor it for overutilization. So it's all about reinforcing primary care and bolstering primary care. And I, I often think about when I was full-time in primary care internal medicine, that is my professional background, as, my, as easy as it may have been to see office visits for minor acute conditions because I was in the office and I had a, a appointment available, many times that wasn't necessary, and my time could have been deployed, had it been needed, could have been deployed more constructively towards something that really did warrant an in-person visit, allowing those minor situations to be addressed either by me, my staff, or partners in care uh, via telemedicine technologies. And so now we're at a place where that's starting to really, to really sing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sue from Penske to describe an employer experience because Penske has been an early adopter and advocate and a great success story around the deployment of telemedicine for their population. And then we'll get into some outcomes with Ryan June from Teladoc. So, Sue, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm Sue Newmiller, and I am a benefits manager at Penske. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our company experience with you this afternoon. So we can go to the next slide or I should say my first slide. Uh, let's talk about Penske a little bit to give you a company overview. We are a privately held global transportation organization. We provide trucks, tractor trailers, over 250,000 of them in leasing, rental, and contract maintenance environments. And the logistics services that we provide are dedicated contract management, transportation management, consulting and brokerage. At this point, we have well over 22,000 employees worldwide. The majority of our workforce um, is basically made up of drivers, warehouse workers, and truck technicians. In addition to that, we have 150 separate collectively bargained agreements with Teamsters, UAW, and many machinist unions. Annually, our revenue is $4.5 billion. 3.5 of that is made of truck rental, leasing, and contract maintenance. One billion of that is really uh, made up of our logistics services. We can go to the next slide. Okay. We have challenges like many organizations our size. We need to manage the health care cost. We have communication obstacles, as you can imagine, uh, considering how the majority of our workforce is made up. We have emergency room abuse. Uh, we have about 50% of our associates that do not have a family doctor. We easily have 50% of associates and members that are not adherent with their prescriptions. So we need non-emergency medical care for drivers, 5,000 drivers alone, and decentralized operations, which um, is a challenge because it's not like we have one cent – we have a centralized location, but we're spread across 50 states, and a lot of our sites are very small. They could actually be two- or three-person shops. So let's go to the next slide. 
Okay. So our key goals, and one of the things that we focus on, of course, like most organizations, is obtaining C-suite buy-in. So the goal, basically, our major goal, is to maintain the year-over-year health care cost increase to one-half of the national market trend. So we have extended success, success stories over the past years by implementing several programs designed to improve our member engagement and manage utilization cost. Uh, we've partnered using many disease management programs and pre-certification programs to help maintain our cost in those areas. Uh, one of our goals, of course, is to reduce the emergency room abuse by increasing engagement with the healthcare provider community. We want to enhance healthcare for our associates by offering and providing convenient access to medical care at no cost to our associates. Considering uh, the occupation of many of our associates, uh, they're on the road a lot and it is hard for them to get care, quality care when they need it. We want to maintain favorable perception from our covered I'm human thinking. workforce and anything we can do to help maintain that, of course, is plus. Um, obtaining the buy-in is always a win-win for our associates by getting the favorable perception of our offerings and coverages. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay. Implementation for success. We are engaged with our key field leaders early, and that's one thing we did when we implemented the Teladoc program to our associates. We had um, a push out and a campaign to all senior management and localized management in all the locations across the country. We have a wellness council, and we did uh, ask them for some suggestions and thoughts surrounding the Teladoc uh, medical service. and. Another main portion of our implementation process was our communication strategy. When I go out and do the open enrollment meetings, I highlight the uh, services of Teladoc in my presentations as much as possible and also during the webinars and any time we go out for open enrollment, we make sure we bring that to the table. We have Teladoc posters predominantly uh, posted in many of our locations. We try to have them in the break rooms, uh, bulletin boards, and common areas. Uh, quarterly, we send out postcards, and they go directly to the home, because often we find that the um, partner in a, a relationship is much more engaged in the um, medical care for the family members. And then, of course, whenever we're out at one of our sites, we always try to remind folks of the Teladoc services that are available to them and encourage them to take advantage of them. So that was our initial implementation process, and we constantly try to refresh that. So we've learned some lessons along the way. So let's go to the next page and visit those together. So we've learned that the best way to sell this service is face-to-face, -face, and so that's one of the reasons when we go out for our open enrollment or new hire orientation, we always bring this out and refresh it to our associates. We learn to tout the high quality of the program's physicians, as it's very important to make our associates feel very comfortable with the um, accreditation that the physicians have and to know that you know, they've completed all their necessary programs and licensing. We've assured our associates that all of the appointments that they have are strictly confidential, that we never know if they reached out personally. We, again, the communication strategy, that was pretty crucial for our folks, uh, and we keep on trying to refresh that so that they don't forget that the services exist. And again, something that has been a very important lesson for us is the word of mouth. We have been very successful and fortunate in that our associates have shared their experiences, and um, it's, it's really been beneficial to this program. So let's go to the next slide, and we can um, talk a little bit about the success stories that have been shared. Um, you never know. We have two here to, 
to talk about a little bit. One of our associates was happy with the service, uh, called and got uh, his, his or her questions answered immediately. Uh, they found the folks at Teladoc to be very personable. And over the winter, they felt it saved them uh, with, with the economic expense of having to get medical care. And then, of course, they were able to take that savings and redirect it to some other family activities. The second member of our team that felt that the Teladoc services were wonderful, had a, a common sinus cold type situation, and appreciated the savings for time and money when they knew what was wrong and what was necessary and they didn't have to leave their home and go to the doctor and sit there for a long time. So again, these are just two positive success stories. And I can be honest with you, whenever I'm out in front of the associates, um, they're very nice. They share their experiences, and many of them have shared positive results from the Teladoc services. So that is basically the Penske um, company experience. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ryan June, who is the Director of Healthcare and Teladoc. Thank you, Sue. That was very much appreciated and, and always enjoy hearing about the Penske experience again. It, it's great to see. And before we go in, and, and JC, we can move right to my first slide if you don't mind. Before we go into uh, the value proposition that, that we at Teladoc feel is, is out there in the telemedicine industry, and more specifically we te with Teladoc, I wanted to give you a, a quick overview of the process one uh, might encounter once they are looking to do a Teladoc consult. And as you can see here, it's really a six-step process, uh, very, very quick. And from start to finish, we're, we're really considering about a 30-minute time frame. Uh, and that's the, the step one, going online through our call center or through a mobile app to complete a medical history, um, similar to the uh, clipboard you would see at the beginning of your uh, doctor's office visit. Going then through that, once completed, requesting a consult. And, and the great thing about this, again, you have uh, the ability to do it tel telephonically um, through a web or a mobile app-enabled video. Um, and, and then uh, the other approach that one could take is telephonically with uploading uh, still images or high-resolution images to, to help uh, you know, impact your, your, your physician's experience as well. Uh, and then once requested, uh, typically within about uh, 15 minutes or so, you'll be contacted by a physician unless obviously you schedule a, a specific time, uh, and you'll have that your doctor's consult. Hopefully you see the resolution, and, and uh, to Rich's point from earlier in, in the presentation, we're experiencing about a 91% resolution in rate across our book of business, which um, for us is very important to, to make sure that folks are receiving the clinical quality that, they, that they're uh, entrusting us with. Um, and then step five, again, as Rich mentioned earlier, that continuity of care, trying to loop in your uh, primary care provider if, if one would allow us. And then ultimately the final step is if there is a member cost share or member liability, uh, similar to the copay structure, the, the liability one would pay on the way out of their doctor's office visit, you would be required to do that at the end of your consult. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, we, we do provide the option of, of doing this telephonically or, or through web-enabled uh, video. Next slide, please. With that brief overview of, of um, how the process works, we wanted to give you an idea of the value that we believe telemedicine offers. Um, and going back about two years ago now, we really took our first foray into data-driven analysis of the program and the impact that we could have uh, on the uh, employer cost line. And, and to truly do that, we needed to uh, answer a couple of questions. And, and the four main questions that came about were, what is the total cost of care uh, one receives, whether at, the, at their PCP, in an urgent care, or in an emergency room setting? Once you include not only that initial visit, but all the ancillary services, lab work, radiology, et cetera, that might be included or, or as, uh, included as part of that initial visit. Then again, speaking a little bit more directly or looking a little bit more directly into what are the conditions that Teladoc typically treats and trying to identify the cost for that. And as Richard mentioned earlier, we do actually treat quite a broad spectrum of 
uh, diagnoses, and, and to date our top 50 diagnoses makes up only about 80% of our total uh, consultation volume. So as you can see, a pretty wide-ranging uh, array of, of diagnoses. So we wanted to identify what the cost profile is for those specific costs, uh, for those specific diagnoses would be. Um, the next piece, in order to understand where the true value and the savings opportunity is, we needed to know, one, where are people going? Where, where were they likely to go had they not called Teladoc? If one didn't have access to Teladoc, where would you have gone? And we asked the question, where would you have gone had you not called Teladoc uh, prior to every consult? Whether, again, whether that's telephonic or uh, through the video that question is asked. And then at the end, trying to understand what is the productivity value that telemedicine brings. And, in, and, and that is with that as a savings opportunity by keeping folks, um, one, at, at the office or on the job, um, or you know, giving them access to care later in the evening so that they don't have to leave work for, for uh a doctor's office visit, et cetera. So those are the four main questions we look to answer. Um, to answer that, we actually uh, contracted with a, an outside actuarial firm about two years ago now to really dive into a significant amount of data to do this research for us and came up with a very, a very valid and actuarial cert, actuarially certified uh, model to, to um, you know, go through ROI analyses with. And to the next slide, JC. What we're looking at here is not a full ROI picture, but trying to understand the, the impact to just claims. Um, some of the services, service expenses. So understanding what is the cost in the case of Penske, what is the cost of somebody going to their PCP uh, for a teledoc type diagnosis currently on the Penske program? Same with the ER, et cetera. We then look at the or subtract out the sum of the teledoc visit expenses. And, and in this case, this is uh, typically the $40 per consult that, that is charged for a teledoc uh, consult. And we're looking at this on an allowed cost basis or total cost of the claim. So obviously, if a member cost share uh, is in there, that would not be impacted in this, in this analysis. We're looking at the total cost of the claim. And then finally, what is the productivity savings element? And we'll get to that in just a second in terms of how we, how we calculate that. But all those uh, pieces together ultimately give us the gross claim savings and trying to understand how we may impact the, the overall trend line. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, and now the productivity element. And there is um, quite a bit here that we can that we can talk through from a productivity element. Um, the approach here is to, to measure the value of time saved at work uh, following the onset of illness or intervention. And, and what I mean by that is we're trying to account for the time somebody may be in the office but not feeling well um, and, and hasn't received care, so their productivity suffers. The other side of that is somebody needs to leave work um, for, for receiving care or they don't show up at all and because they, they don't feel well and need to leave, uh, go to receive care during the day. Um, some high-level productivity assumptions that we build into our model. Um, the first piece, four hours saved per employee consult. This is important um, because we are not taking into account any uh, savings opportunity for any consults related to dependents, whether that's spouse or, or dependent children. It's really looking at just the employee side of things. Four hours is assuming that half a day is missed for one to go and receive care. Uh, <clears throat> to offset this, we then apply uh, the client's average annual salary, or if that's not provided to us, a national average can be used, um, and broken down to an hourly wage. And then the other piece that we don't uh, credit productivity savings for is the folks that when they call us, and, and this is a subset of, of redirection, um, the folks that said they would have done nothing. Um, so in, in some ways it's a slight increase in cost to the plan. Um, because they had that access through Teladoc, um, they, they typically wouldn't have gone somewhere else, but because they had Teladoc, they are able to, to receive care. So in those cases, we're, we're not... Uh, offering any productivity savings for those particular folks. Uh, to, to then come up with a bit of a calculation here, it's adjusted by the employee-dependent use ratio. 
So we start with four hours per employee consult um, and then make an adjustment. It's four hours for employee and zero for any dependent base. So for example, if the employees are responsible for 50% of, of consults at four hours, Independents are responsible for 50% of the consult volume at zero hours. An average of two hours per consult would be used in that case. And obviously, uh, we do see varying degrees of use uh, ratios between employees and dependents, and, and that uh, productivity element would be impacted by the actual use rates there. Uh, the additional areas of interest, and, and while we have tried to come up with a productivity assumption and, and approach that is fairly straightforward and fairly basic, there are certainly areas of contention on both sides, whether it's uh, things we could change, things we're taking, we, we may be looked at for taking too much credit for, et cetera, and, and here's a few of them. So impact for de dependent child use. As I mentioned today, we don't uh, take any uh, productivity savings or, or uh, implement any productivity savings into our modeling for dependent use uh, in, in, in that particular case. It also includes dependent children. Um, one could argue that uh, mom or dad typically has to leave work to go in uh, to take the, ch the dependent child to, to uh, health care services. They have to pick them up from school when they're sick, et cetera, and that is time away from work. Um, so we're not doing that today, and, and that's understandable that it's going to be very difficult to pick and choose you know, which ones they really needed to, to leave work for, et cetera. Um, so for, for now, we've simplified and left that alone. Time of day um, is another area where we don't actually uh, look at today. Um, and, and that is one um, on the opposite side where we may be taking credit for uh, a consult that happened at 10 o'clock at night. One could argue you know, that's not necessarily productivity saved. Um, but again, I, I offset that with the dependent child area. Um, so going back to my original comment, some areas where, you know, we can have a little give and take on either way, on either side, um, I think ultimately the simplified approach we've taken um, somewhat washes out and, and is, is a pretty fair assumption uh, to, to be had here. Uh, next slide, please. And now talking specifically about the results that we've seen with Penske, and for those that may have listened to this presentation um, earlier in the year, um, we originally looked at a case study that was done for 2013, and we have updated this to look at both 2013 and 2014, and we've put them on a similar basis. Um, looking to the kind of left-hand side of this, and the, the information and data is, is the same on the, or, or what we're looking at is the same on each side of the uh, the, the bucket here of, of the, t the slide, but looking at 2013 on the left and 2014 on the right. Starting on 2013, we look at uh, the kind of donut, uh, a total of just under 1,800 consults occurred in 2013 for Penske, and we look at the breakdown of where the redirection uh, responses occurred. Um, roughly 80% um, would have gone or said they would have gone to a PCP or urgent care. And if you look in the middle of the bucket there, the middle of the slide, uh, you see what the savings is for every consult that would have gone to the PCP or urgent care. And again, I, I mentioned that these are net savings, so these are looking at um, the cost, the claim cost to go to the PCP minus um, the $40 consult fee gives you the savings that you see there. Um, important to note, 8% would said they would have gone to the ER. Um, that is, in terms of member redirection response, pretty close to our book of business average. Um, if we shake that out down towards the bottom and we look at redirected claim savings, um, the redirection results multiplied by the savings uh, outlined in the middle give you about $226,000 in redirected claim savings just from those 1,800 consults. If we look at adding the productivity element, another $110,000 in increased productivity. Um, all said for that year, for 2013, $336,000. If we shift over to the right-hand side of the page and we look at 2014, the first number that jumps out is a, is a, a remarkable increase in the number of consults from one year to the next. And we'll look at percentages and that sort of thing on the very next slide, but almost 1,000 more consults in 2014 than there were in 2013, which is remarkable growth in the program. And if we look down to the bottom right-hand corner, that's reflected, that growth is reflected in the claim savings um, down below. 
an increase of $110,000 to $336,000 in claim savings, increased productivity to $164,000, and now for a total 12-month savings in 2014, a half a million dollars versus $336,000 in 2013. Significant growth in the volume of consults, which directly uh, results in increased savings opportunity. One of the few programs um, in healthcare where increased utilization actually leads to, uh, is a good thing and leads to increased savings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just a chart that, that kind of outlines the information from 2013 and 2014 on the previous slide in terms of consultation volume. Um, and you can see the blue line on top uh, being 2014, the substantial growth on a monthly basis, and then in total, uh, an increase of almost 48,000, 48% 48 from 2013 to 2014. Um, and if we look at utilization down on the bottom, 15% um, utilization in 2013, and a 19% utilization in 2014, both well above our book of business, um, and and, and to Sue's points before about the strong implementation process and um, continued growth in terms of their learning experiences and how to uh, keep communicating the program, you see increased utilization um, and, and that continued growth. One thing I'll point out here, when we consider utilization, it's a very simple number or calculation and, and primarily what it is is a ratio of the number of consults divided by the number of employees during that time period. Um, so ultimately you're saying 15% of the employee population or 1,784 consults is roughly 15.3% of the employee population that had access to the service. Um, and again, a growth in, in 2014. Um, not on the slide, but I thought it was very important to, to point out um, because when, asks, uh, you know, when you see this type of growth, um, the natural question is, you know, at what point does the program plateau? Um, and through May of 2015, so January through May, Penske has already had 14, over 1,400 consults in that five-month period and is well on their way to about 3,500 for the year, which would be about a 24% utilization, which is phenomenal growth, continued growth year over year. I wouldn't say that's the case in every, in every client, but we do see continual growth. I think the reason Penske's growth is so strong one, you see at the very top of this slide, 97% member satisfaction in 2013 and 2014, employees like the service. But to Sue's points earlier, that continued communication and continued learning experience to help uh, promote the program is, is being seen in the results in the consult volume, and that's fantastic to see. And it's year over year, and it's continuing. Next slide, please. Before we leave you today, the, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, Rich mentioned some, some studies that were done early in, in this uh, presentation. Um, we at, at Teladoc have, have also engaged outside sources to start to look at more data. Fantastic thing about uh, this industry is it's still very young but growing quickly. In 2014, Teladoc did 300,000 consults on pace for over a half a million this year. Um, which is fantastic in, in some ways, but the best part about it is that it offers up a data set that continues to grow that one could tap into to better understand patterns mm -hmm. and what people want to see in a telemedicine service. And with that comes our ability to refine the value proposition. Um, we worked with an outside vendor, the Veracity Healthcare Analytics, to, do, to you know, really look at um, data in a different way. Historically, it's been looked at just trying to compare the initial consult for Teladoc in cost to the initial doctor's office visit. And you see a savings in going back to the Penske spend about $56. What we're trying to understand m much more closely here is what happens if you look at it the course of a longer period of time, not just that first visit or that first consult, but over the next, say, 30 days, which this study actually looked at. And, and that's important to note because, one, it's, it's very unique. It's not, it's not something that has been uh, done much in the industry in the past, but also it starts to look at the clinical efficacy of our program and the tele telemedicine programs that are out there. 
are you, as the telemedicine vendor, having that but are you still referring or do people still need to go and receive that follow-up care? Um, Rich mentioned the study that was done by the Stan Corporation earlier that looked at just the follow-up rates. This the follow-up rates plus the dollar impact that it had on overall care. And it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic approach and, and really eye-opening. And, uh, the other piece that we started to look at is member response versus actual claims history. Um, and what we found in the past is when you look at where members say they would have gone, it doesn't necessarily match up to the same patterns that they've had historically. You look at claims, um, you know, one you see a 15% ER use rate of types of diagnoses tell about treats, but in the member response, they're only telling us 6 or 7% would have gone to the ER. So something doesn't match there, and it, it allows us to start to look at claims in a much different way to better understand the value of our service. And next slide, please. And the last slide that I'll, I'll touch on here is um, just some results from this study for one, one group, which was a, a national home improvement retailer population. Uh, next slide, please, Stacey. And I'm frozen here, so hopefully you all can see it and I'll speak to it. Um, the findings here uh, come from this study looking at a 30-day savings opportunity or 30-day period or episode of care. Um, and what was found when you compared Teladoc users versus PCP users over that 30-day period, on average, the Teladoc program was about $191. Um, uh, uh, less expensive. If you do the same analysis and talking about matched cohort analysis, which was uh, very meticulously done, if you compare Teladoc users to a matched population of ER users, the savings was roughly $2,661. It's a huge number um, and, and really highlights the, the effect that ER use can have on a program. Um, and, and what we found uh, through this study was that ER use uh, initial ER use led to higher rates of follow-up care. That significantly impacts the overall cost of one's program. Um, and and the, the Teladoc side of things was able to, to save significant money. If we do a weighted average here again based on the claims uh, and, and how people are actually using services, we saw a claim savings in this case of about $673 per episode or per console. Um, I don't have a number that everybody would see in their own program, but it is uh, a significant uh, savings opportunity that's out there and one that's uh, worth reviewing if, if that's an area of interest for your groups as you move forward in your benefits programs. And, and with that, you see that, that ends my portion, and um, I think we, we are able to open this up for questions or comments. Um, <clears throat> the only question that had been Ask, can, it, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, you okay, can. Um, the only question that had been asked uh, during the presentation was um, whether or not this copy of the presentation will be available um, online. It is. It's actually in the forum section of our website. I'd be happy to email it directly to anyone who is interested. And then um, we did have a second question. Um, HIPAA considerations, what obstacles slash challenges remain? Have you encountered payment issues and or inappropriate use? What applications, this is many questions, <laughs> what applications are in use in the workers' compensation arena? What percentage of telemedicine consults result in referring the patient to go physically see a doctor or ER? Are there any cross-state licensing issues? Um, an example, writing, filing, a prescription, are the doctors, there are many questions in this one, um, are the doctors all U.S. based, are all teledoc doctors board certified in active practice? Um, it may be best to go each o over each one of those. Um, I'm sure Ryan caught them all, so go for it, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best, and, and Sue, I'll, I will uh, actually pass a couple questions over to uh, in, in terms of HIPAA and some of the more employer uh, specific based questions around uh, ERISA and HIPAA and, and things like that that I know you all would have uh, 
have encountered through, throughout your implementation. But I can speak to the doctor side of things and, and the Teladoc side of things very quickly. Um, Teladoc actually has their own uh, proprietary network where we uh, credential each doctor that comes into our network. Um, each doctor is licensed in the state. That it, in many states, the requirement, and, and uh, one thing to keep in mind here, um, this telemedicine is regulated at the state level, so there are many different uh, approaches based on the state that you are in at the time. Um, the consultation will always be handled by, at the very least, a doc uh, licensed in the state that the person is rest requesting the consult from. Um, that is a requirement to, one, be able to write the script in, in that state. Um, our network uh, approach is actually to route all calls to resident docs, so docs resident and licensed in the state that um, the consult is coming from first. Um, and, and there are certain states where that is a requirement. That is not a requirement in the majority of states, but something that we feel is, is appropriate and new and very to do in, across our book. Um, so I think that handles the licensing, the credentialing side, and um, some of the re regulatory issues. I, I'm not sure if there were any in there, JC, that I may have missed. Um, I believe on your end, I, I suppose consults, when, at what point does a consult result in, in telling a patient to go see a doctor or go to the ER? Um, sure, thank you. So there, our, our statistic, and it's a self-reported number, some of the data that we've seen has supported this uh, through cl actual claims. The self-reported number is about 91% resolution rate, which means that about 9% of the um, consults or, or calls um, are not handled fully or fully resolved on that first call. Um, what we found, um, about half of that um, are folks that are referred on, whether it's straight to the ER or folks that are referred uh, right away to their PCP for a follow-up visit. The other half are, are um, typically calls that come in for um, issues that really aren't appropriate for telemedicine, which there certainly are. Um, and. Um, we will you know, tell folks this is not the right uh, arena for this. You need to do this X, Y, and Z and, and give them the right path. Um, there are a handful that come in that are uh, unfortunately drug seeking um, and there's no DEA uh, regulated drugs available through the Teladoc program. Um, so those are calls that are not resolved. So it's 91% first call resolution um, with, with really a mixed bag, probably 6% or so that are referred elsewhere, and then another two or three that are not uh, appropriate for the telemedicine space necessarily. Okay, and then uh, the I believe the first questions were more or less geared towards Sue. Um, what what type of HIPAA considerations did you take into take into account when beginning all of this? What obstacles or challenges still remain after implementing? Um, have you encountered payment issues and or inappropriate use through this? And then what applications are in use in the workers' compensation arena? Okay. Well, um, with respect to ERISA and HIPAA, the program is, you know, compliant. Uh, we obviously have everything vetted from legal counsel before we implement anything. Uh, with respect to the HIPAA side of it, all the reports, all the information uh, that we get from the Teladoc group is strictly headcount trends and patterns. There's, you know, nothing that calls out uh, anything that would, you know, should not be disclosed. Uh, with respect to the associates calling in, it's all confidential. The web-based is confidential. Uh, I know the HIPAA guidelines with respect to age and answering medical questions um, are controlled, uh, things of that nature. It is definitely a HIPAA-compliant program from where we sit, and it does meet all the legal requirements. Uh, we really haven't had anything come up that would be, you know, outside of that. Uh, so that covers the HIPAA and the ERISA stuff. Uh, what else are they looking for there? Um, what obstacles and challenges remain now that you've implemented the program? Um, um, payment issues and then anything linked to workers' comp? Okay, workers' comp uh, really is separate. Uh, the Teladoc program really wouldn't be on the workers' comp side. That's a, a different uh, benefit focus. And uh, this is more of like 
employee health medical um, program, our workers' comp folks aren't directed to use the teledoc services. Uh, so that would be one thing. Uh, with respect to obstacles, uh, we really haven't had any obstacles keeping it fresh. Uh, and as uh, Ryan had mentioned, there are some times when teledoc services would not be the best arena for the medical situation, but in all of those situations, um, teledoc's guidance has been very clear and uh, not an issue. JC, it's Rich. I, I might add a, an additional comment um, to to Sue's in response to this question. Um, of course, you know everything Sue said is 100% right around compliance with with HIPAA and and, um, and privacy, and and we've talked about quality. And, and even though that's all true, what we've learned through our experience with Penske and other employers is that we need to be very sensitive to communicating that to people, to employees, to members, because they, they may have in the back of their minds some concerns about privacy, and they may have some concerns in the back of their minds about quality, and therefore proactive communication that reassures and addresses those concerns is actually a critical step toward adoption. And so it's, it's, it's a best practice as one rolls this out to head on address those concerns that people surely have whether they're saying it or not. I'm I'm curious, Rich, up in in up in, in in the development of this uh, some research findings. Were you able to dis, um, define how people assessed what quality care was, what what that looks like, um, at least in the doctor's office, and um, how did you make that transferable to telemedicine? Well, that's a really interesting question. It's a whole big topic, which is what is quality? Uh, quality to a health services researcher, let's say like the authors of the papers that we were, we were referencing before, would be, uh, does it appear that the person's condition resolved um, appropriately in the right time frame um, and similar to other modes of care that are standards of care? That, that's quality to them, right? And, and so I looked at it in that way, and I said, well, you know, the, the resolution rate or, or the treatment failure rate was comparable, less than, you know, less than 10%, single digits. That's good, uh, because we're comparing to current standard of care without telemedicine. But quality to a patient might be a little bit different. Uh, it might be the experience. It might be uh, how well the process works. It might be whether they're getting what they think they need, which may or may not be consistent yeah, with best yeah. medical evidence, right? And so, so we always have to be sensitive to that, and, and, and that's why, that's why um, communication, education, and, and transparency is really important. Very good. So we have um, two more questions. Um, the first one is, how does, how does this improve meta-adherence? So um, whoever wants to comment on that, and then I'll, once we finish that, I'll, I'll list the last question. Well, I'll try to address some of it, and I'm sure that um, Ryan and Rich might have some things to add to that. When you first sign up for Teladoc, you either on the web or over the phone, somehow you relay like a health history like you would to your doctor, and you describe all your medications. So therefore, if for some reason you would be calling Teladoc for a medical condition, often as they go through your meds and what your condition your condition is, uh, some of them that might, that might come from the physician diagnosing your specific situation might surround um, your utilization of the meds that you should be taking and how to utilize them properly. Thanks, Sue. Ryan, do you have comments on that from a teledoc perspective? I, I'll add some uh, after you, if you'd like. Sure, and I think you know, in some ways, it's it's more of a, a an access issue where it makes things easier to get uh, you know chronic medications refilled and that sort of thing. But um, one of the great things that that we have in place with Aetna and and, and Rich, this I think goes back some to um, mentioned earlier, and, and the connect, connectivity of all the different players in the healthcare system. The, the connection that we have with Aetna allows us to interchange data that that uh, other resources may or may not have. Um, and, and what's great about that is that data allows us to identify certain gaps in care and things that, that um, you know, 
we can we can speak to a member at the time of their actual need, as opposed to um, you know just they're not feeling sick or they're they're feeling great. Um, they don't necessarily um, listen to that sort of advice. Whereas in this particular instance, they're calling us at, to a provider when they're not feeling well, and they might be more apt to listen to somebody uh, at in their time of need. So I think that connectivity uh, in, in the data exchange there is, is an important player in. Uh, things like adherence. And, and, Rich, I don't know more from a clinical side of, of things, uh, your thoughts on that. Well, you know, because there's so many perspectives, and I'm really glad that the, uh, that the person asked that question. Adherence is such a huge issue. No easy answers there, right? And, and where I'd start is by recognizing that telemedicine is evolving. We're, we're, what we're talking about today is an episodic telemedicine encounter for minor acute care. So adherence for chronic doesn't really relate to that, does it? I'm, but I could envision, not too far in the future, telemedicine encounters that relate to chronic conditions where adherence is central. And so we're going to need to have this discussion again in a year, and it may be a different or evolving answer. But the today answer, it's still relevant because of the need for and the expectation that telemedicine encountered back, back to treating providers, primary care doctors, and others. Because the conditions that people have are, are going to are going to stick around, and the acute care situation that may have been addressed through tele, telemedicine through teledoc that may in some way relate to their ability to be adherent with other medications and other treatments and other other care, and that's why that's why shared information around medication around medication profiles, shared information about what's being prescribed, that's critical because that's part of the reason complex issue, but why why patients sometimes become not adherent, lack of coordination, lack of integration, lack of looking at all of their conditions and, and drugs in, in a holistic way. So uh, that's, that's uh, my best answer to that excellent question. Um, okay, so then the last question is, sorry, click through. Um, can and is information discussed on the call transmitted to the patient's primary care physician? So I, I'll take that one if you don't mind. The, the short answer is yes, if the member allows it. Every opportunity um, that we have, we will share that information, but ultimately it, uh, it is the member of the past's um, determination of if we share anything. Um, we, our, our goal is to uh, allow that connectivity to happen on every consultation. Unfortunately, there are times where, one, the member may not have a PCP, um, two, they may not provide that PCP's information, or three, they just may not allow it. They might look at it as uh, you know, a one-off thing that they don't really feel is necessary. Um, our goal would be to have that connectivity after every consult, and we do offer that option. Okay, excellent. Um, so that has been all of the questions uh, for today, and I would just like to wrap up and thank everyone for their time and for sharing with us their story. Um, this webinar will be posted in about a week to our website and our Knowledge Bank if you would like to share it with your colleagues um, since it has been recorded. If you have any uh, additional questions or would like to follow up with the speakers, feel free to email IBI or to me personally and I can direct you um, and help you start a dialogue with them. Um, so thank you, Rich. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Joe. Uh, it is much appreciated. and. Um, we will certainly uh, direct where to where the slides are um, as well after um, we end this and I'll follow up and just so you can all have um, that for, for your own purposes. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank you.